This week, we're starting a new series called Get Happy, a study in the Beatitudes. Now, as you can imagine from the title of this series, the series is going to be about happiness. How do we get happy? And that kind of is an interesting question. How do you know if you're happy or not? There's a little something I like to use that I wanted to share with you. I like to use something called uh, Scott's Happiness Guide, and that's what tells me whether or not I've had a happy week. It's a four-point checklist. Let me, let me show it to you. As you can see there, there's four things that I use to determine whether or not I was happy in the week. The first thing is Melanie made a meat-centric dinner, so whether or not my wife made dinners that had a lot of meat in them. And you'll see I put a smiley face there, so she did. Good job, Melanie. The second thing is, did my kids get along this week? And as you can see, there's a sad face, so no, they did not get along this week. Number three, did my fantasy football team win? Again, sad face. My fantasy football team lost, and my top wide receiver blew out his ACL, so it was a pretty crummy fantasy football week. And fourth and finally, did I find something to watch on Netflix? And I gave myself a meh because I kind of did, but I didn't really enjoy it that much. So if you look there, I got one and a half smiley faces out of four, not my best week. Okay, but really, how do we figure out if we're happy? And where does happiness come from? And maybe most importantly of, of all, how do we get it? How do we really get happiness into our lives? Because I think we all want to be happy. Well, those are the questions that we're going to answer in this series when we look at something that we call the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes, I know that word is kind of a fancy word, but the, Be the word Beatitude comes from a Latin word meaning blessed. And what this is, is it's a bunch of sayings of Jesus where he tells us how to be blessed or rather how to be happy. And what Jesus is going to do in this series, as we look at these verses from Jesus, as we look at his teaching, Jesus is going to talk about happiness in a pretty surprising way. You see, Jesus is going to give us an upside down view of happiness. He's going to change the way a lot of us think of what it means to have a happy life and how to get there. What we're going to find out is that all of us can get happy in our lives, but it's going to happen through some circumstances that we might not expect. So as we start this series, go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we find the Beatitudes, uh, these list of verses that Jesus uses to tell us how to get happy. Go ahead and open your Bibles, and we'll start right there. The Beatitudes come at the beginning of Jesus' most famous teaching in the Bible. His most famous teaching is called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus covers lots of subjects. He challenges us. He encourages us. He just amazes us through his teachings. And, and not just us today, but 2,000 years ago, people were amazed by the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it was all over the Jerusalem Times bestseller list. This was a big deal when Jesus spoke these words. And at the very beginning is what we call the Beatitudes, what we're going to study in this series. So let's look at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Here's what we find. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Jesus was a big deal at this point. Everybody wanted to meet Jesus. You know, he's performing miracles. He's casting out demons and healing people. He's teaching amazing things. And so everybody wanted to see Jesus. Everyone wanted to meet him. He had lots of Facebook friends and Twitter followers. He's a really big deal. And so he goes up on this mountainside and his disciples and the crowds gather around him and he sits down which is kind of odd. Normally when I want to teach, I, I stand up. But Jesus sits down because that's what Jewish teachers did in his day. He sat down and he began to teach his people all sorts of different things. And as we've said, he starts off with the Beatitudes, this list of sayings that Jesus gives us about how to get happy. And Jesus, as we've said, doesn't just approach happiness in sort of the, the same old way that we might think of happiness. Jesus does something really amazing in the Beatitudes. Jesus redefines happiness for us. That's what Jesus is doing in the Beatitudes. He's redefining happiness. Now, if you have your Bibles open and you look at the first few verses of Matthew chapter 5, you're going to notice that Jesus uses one word over and over again, and it's the word bless. He says, God blesses, and then he explains the kind of person or the type of person whom God blesses. But really, what does the word blessed mean? 
It's not a word we use a lot in everyday conversation. Maybe at church you sing about God blessing someone, but the word blessed means happy. God makes these kind of people happy. But the word happy can mean a lot of different things. We can use the word happy in a lot of different situations if you think about it. Like for example, I've got four kids and when I take my kids to McDonald's, they are happy. They are completely and totally happy when we roll up to McDonald's and they look at the window and they see the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle toys that are gonna be in their Happy Meal. I mean, they are happy in that moment. But you know, that happiness only lasts for a few minutes because eventually they realize that the next night, mom is gonna make them eat broccoli for dinner to make up for the, the McDonald's Happy Meal they had. So that's happiness, but it's fleeting. You know, another time when I'm happy, I'm happy when I eat a chocolate donut. And when I pick up a chocolate donut and I eat that thing, man, I am so happy in that moment. That turns my day right around. But so often after I eat that first chocolate donut, what do I do? I go in and I grab a second chocolate donut. I eat the second one and I am no longer happy, right? I just start to think about all that that donut is costing me and how kind of yucky I feel after eating two chocolate donuts. So when Jesus is talking about happiness, he's not talking about the kind of happiness that my kids feel. He's not talking about chocolate donut happiness. He's using happiness in a very different way. So what I wanna do is I wanna define happiness for you. In fact, this is how we're gonna use happiness and being happy throughout the entire series. So let's take a look at this definition. Happiness is an internal joy from God that doesn't depend on life's circumstances. Okay, let's break down that definition a little bit. In there it says that happiness is an internal joy that we get from God. In other words, we can't produce this kind of happiness in our lives. If we're gonna be truly and completely and totally happy, it's not just something that we can manufacture or fake. It's gonna to have to come from God. And that's what Jesus is saying. God is the one who will make us happy. And in fact, he's gonna make us happy in a way that it will stick with us throughout life's circumstances. I mean, that's the problem with the kind of happiness I was talking about earlier, right? It comes and goes. But God offers us a happiness that sticks with us throughout the things we experience in life. In fact, Jesus is going to say, there's a lot of situations that from the outside, from a human point of view, look pretty crummy and look pretty bad. And Jesus is going to say, actually, when you're in those circumstances, you can be happy. And so whatever you're facing in life right now, whether it's a financial crisis or a health crisis or a relationship crisis or whatever it is, Jesus says that you can be happy in the good times, in the bad times, in the boring times of life, you can be happy if you have this internal joy from God. And so that's what Jesus is offering us. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first beatitude. We find it in verse three. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Okay, so Jesus starts off the Beatitudes by saying that God will bless you, God blesses you if you are poor and realize your need for him. Now, I wanna begin by talking about what is this verse not saying? What is, what is Jesus not trying to say in this verse? See, Jesus is not saying that you will be happy if you don't have a lot of money. Now, the Bible has lots to say about poverty. In fact, as you read the Bible, you find that God cares deeply for those who are poor, for those who don't have enough money to take care of themselves, for those who are materially needy. God loves them, and if you're a Christian, God calls you to help those people. But Jesus isn't saying, well, you'll be really happy as long as you don't have any money. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because I'm sure you've met people like this, I know I've met people like this, people who are poor, but are, who are desperately unhappy. And they're unhappy often because what, if you ask them, well, what do you need most in life? They wouldn't say God. They'd say, well, what I need most in life is money and stuff and possessions. And so they're not happy because they don't realize their need for God. They realize the need that they think they have, which is for money and for stuff, and which of course is important at a certain level, but that's not the most important thing in life. You see, what Jesus is talking about is something that other translations of the Bible, like the New International Version, refers to as being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit. And that means that you are a person who realizes how dependent you are upon God. 
how desperately you need God. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying those who are poor and realize their need for God, those who look at themselves and recognize they need God's help, they need God for everything. That's the kind of person that Jesus says, God will make you happy. So what I wanna do is I wanna rephrase this beatitude for us today, and here's what this beatitude, here's what Jesus is saying, this blessing, this happiness, how it comes into our lives is when we do this, when you admit you aren't good enough for God. God blesses people who recognize that they need a savior, that they need a rescuer, that they need help. And, and what Jesus is saying here, realizing your need for God, he's not just saying, well, you realize that, yeah, you're not completely perfect, you need a little help. No, Jesus is saying that God blesses people who recognize they're deeply dependent upon God. That, that as you look at God and you see God and, and he's, he's perfect, he's holy as the Bible says, which means he's morally perfect in every way. He has no sin in him, he has, he has no evil, within him. And as you look at God and you recognize how perfect he is, you look at yourself and you realize you're not good enough for God and I'm not good enough for God. We simply don't measure up to him. And the Bible says that the reason that we don't measure up to God is because we have sin in our lives. Take a look at what Romans 3.23 says. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. This verse is telling us an important truth that all of us have sin in our lives. Again, sin's a churchy kind of word, but sin simply refers to any time that you wander off of God's pathway. Anytime, you know, God says, this is the way you should live your life and you go off in a different direction or you go in the opposite direction. Anytime God says, here's what I want you to do and you fail to do it. Anytime you hurt somebody, whether it's a spouse or a, uh, one of your kids or a friend or even an enemy, God says all those times you do selfish things that hurt other people that are against God, that's sin. And we all have sin in our lives. And because we have any sin at all in our lives, we're not good enough for God. And so what Jesus is saying is that God makes happy. God blesses those who recognize that they need a savior. They need a rescuer and that they can't save themselves. And when the Bible talks about a savior and a rescuer and the fact that we need to come to the point where we realize that we need a savior, we need a rescuer, it's talking about Jesus Christ, that he is our only savior and our only rescuer. If you think about it, this beatitude is, is really what it's talking about is it's the op opposite of people who are spiritually arrogant. Have you ever met anybody who's what I would call spiritually arrogant? You see this sometimes in religious people. You know, religious people who they look at all those around them and they look down on them because, uh, you know, they, they think of themselves as religious people. They, they talk about all the things they do with, for their church, you know, or all the good moral things they do or all the money that they donate to God and other works. And, and they really just kind of lean on and they trumpet, they promote their own works, their own good works is sort of the reason why they're good people and, and the reason why they're acceptable to God and the reason why they know they're gonna go to heaven when they die. And they sort of look down on the rest of us, you know, those who aren't as religious. And, and, and one of the ways you know people who are spiritually arrogant like that, one of the ways you know what they're like is because they're the kind of people that when they pray, they pray these long prayers with all sorts of flowery words that are really hard to understand what even they're talking about. But, you know, they just kind of want to hear themselves talk and impress everybody by how religious they sound. You know, that's spiritual pride. And Jesus is talking about the opposite of spiritual pride. That's what people need to have. Now, you don't have to be religious in order to be uh, spiritually prideful. I've known a number of atheists and agnostics who didn't believe in God and, or didn't have anything to do with God, and yet that was sort of a pride in, them, in, in themselves because they thought, you know, I don't really need a God. I don't need someone to rescue me. I don't need a God to save me. I'm not really that bad. I'm not really that messed up. And however you look at it, that is a form of arrogance. It's a form of pride. And Jesus says that God can't do anything with someone like that. God can't do anything with someone who looks at their own accomplishments. And that can be hard because, you know, as humans, we might accomplish a lot of things that look really impressive. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of the Apostle Paul. Paul was a, a teacher, a missionary in the early Christian church. He wrote a lot of books in the New Testament. And in one book, Philippians, he talks about all the things he did before he became a Christian. He didn't grow up as a Christian. He talks about the fact he was born into the right family. 
And he talks about the fact that he had the best education. And he talks about the fact that when it came to his religion, nobody was better than Paul. Nobody outdid Paul. He was the best of the best. And as he looked at his life, he realized, after he became a Christian, he realized that he had a lot of pride in those things, a lot of pride in his accomplishments. And take a look at, as a Christian, how he viewed all those human accomplishments. Here's what he says in verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. What Paul's saying here is amazing. He says that all those things I accomplished in my life, all the things that I did, even with my, within my own religion, you see, Paul was, was better at religion than any of us will ever be. And yet Paul says, none of that was good enough for God. None of that got me to God. What got me to God was believing in Jesus, was trusting in him. That's what brought me eternal life, Paul is saying. And all those other things in comparison are rubbish. And so I don't know what you've accomplished in your life. Maybe you have an amazing education. You've got a great career. Maybe your, your kids are all grown up and you have wonderful adult children and you just did a great job raising your family and all those things are good. But none of those things are good enough for God. None of those things bring you salvation. The only way to receive happiness from God when it, and the only attitude that really works when it comes to salvation is this attitude that recognizes that anything that we do to try and come to God, in the end of the day, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. We need a savior, we need a rescuer, and only Jesus is that rescuer. Only Jesus can really save us. That's the understanding that Paul came to and, and that's the understanding that every Christian comes to. You come to this attitude where you admit you're not good enough for God. And so as a Christian, I, I hope if you are a Christian that you have a, a lot of humility in your life. I hope you understand that this, even though these words of Jesus are a reminder to us as Christians that we need to have humility in our lives, that we come to Christ admitting that we're not good enough, that we don't deserve a relationship with God. In fact, we can't get it on our own. It only comes by believing in Jesus and trusting in him. And that attitude of humility that you have when you become a Christian, that attitude should continue on with you as you follow Jesus throughout your life. But before we finish up here, I really want us to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here. Because you read the words of the Beatitudes, and a lot of these, these words of Jesus sound really nice, you know? They, they, they're just really good sounding words that Jesus gives us, the kind of thing that could, you could put on a mug, you know, blessed are the poor, or, or the, you know, imagine if you crochet, I don't crochet myself, but if you crochet, you know, that's great, and, uh, you know, if you could crochet some of these things on a pillow, blessed are the meek, uh, blessed are the poor, and it sounds really nice, you know, I could see that on my grandma's couch on a pillow, you know, blessed are the poor, that sounds great, but don't miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying something very important in this beatitude, and here is what he is saying. He's saying that this attitude that we're talking about is necessary for salvation. Don't miss out on what Jesus is saying. He's saying that the only way you can have a relationship with God is if you adopt this attitude. Jesus isn't saying, well, you know, if, you, if it wouldn't bother you, if it's okay with you, I'd really appreciate it if you recognize your need for me. You know, if you could get around to it at some point in your life, humbling yourself and realizing your dependence on God, that would be great. I'd really appreciate it. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying that in order to come to God, you must realize how deeply you need him. You must admit you're not good enough for God. Let's take a, a look again at this beatitude. As we've seen, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus says that if you adopt this attitude and only if you adopt this attitude, you will receive the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is very simply heaven. It's eternal life. You know, the Bible uses a lot of different words to describe it. There's a lot of different ways we could say it. But at the end of the day, it's the fact that when you die, you will be with God. For all eternity, you'll be with God and with his people in heaven, eternal life, relationship with God. The only way to get that is to adopt this attitude. You see, to be a Christian means that you realize you are not good enough for God. You are not, none, and none of us are. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I'm not good enough. 
Nobody's good enough. Paul wasn't good enough. Mother Teresa's not good enough. None of us are good enough for God. We need a rescuer. We need Jesus because Jesus is not just another teacher who who taught amazing things. He is God himself who came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, to be raised from the dead so that we might have new life. And if you believe in him, if you look and realize that you aren't good enough to be accepted by God, no matter how many things you do for God, how many religious things you do, you're not good enough for God. You need to realize that and you need to put your faith in Jesus. And then, and only then, will you receive the kingdom of heaven. Only then will you be with God when you die. Jesus said it in perhaps even stronger words in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, Jesus' followers were arguing with each other. They were arguing over, who's the greatest? You know, am I the greatest, Jesus? And they were fighting, kind of like little kids. And so Jesus, there were little kids by him. And so Jesus took a little kid and he put him on his lap. And here's what Jesus said. I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying that in order to become a Christian, you need to have this attitude of a little kid. Think about the attitude that a little kid has toward their parents. They're completely dependent upon them, right? I mean, they just need their parents to do everything for them when they're a little baby. And even as a little kid, they're dependent on their parents. They have faith. They trust in their parents. And Jesus says that that's the attitude that we need to have with God. We need to admit we don't have it all together. We desperately and deeply and totally need God from beginning to end in life. Just so you know, our kids and kids' church are also going through this lesson, and this is the verse that they're really going to focus on because it speaks to kids, and it'd be great for you to talk about this with them. And as a parent, this whole verse really speaks to me because I've still got two little kids at home, like really little, and they remind me a lot of what that childlike dependence upon God is. Not too long ago, my daughter, she uh, she's playing with Duplo Legos, you know, the bigger Legos, and she can she can build like four Legos high into a tower, but that's about all she can do. And so one day she wanted to build a castle and she couldn't do it. So she's like, Daddy, can you can you build me a castle? And uh, you know, I'm no I'm no Lego master builder myself, but I didn't want I did not want to disappoint my daughter. And so I said, okay, and uh, I started, you know, building and it was a pretty crude castle, but you know, I I built my I built the castle and all and I said, here you go, honey, here's your castle, you know. And now that was a proud moment as a dad. I built my daughter a castle, really the only one she's ever gonna get from me. So, you know, I hope she enjoyed it. And uh, it was just cool to see her, e- even now she's getting older, she's still dependent upon me for certain things. And Jesus says, that's, that's just a little picture of the attitude that we need to have. That if you wanna be happy, it happens, it begins when you recognize how deeply you need God. Again, as we said at the very beginning, Jesus is turning our understanding of happiness upside down. He's twisting it all around. And he's telling us the way to happiness is by realizing how messed up you are. Again, that might, seem, that might almost seem comical, right? That the way to be happy is to realize how messed up you are. But it's in that moment when you recognize your own sinfulness that you realize how desperately you need God, how desperately you need a Savior, and we all do. So my hope is that you would take Jesus up on his call to to be happy, to be blessed by God, understanding that that happens when you admit how deeply you need him and that you have to have this attitude in order to have eternal life and a relationship with God. And if you're a Christian, Again, I hope that you share this message with other people. You tell people this message and share it with them so they can have a relationship with God. And I hope as Christians that we understand how important humility is. That to come to Christ, we had to be humble, but humility is something that Jesus wants to see in us every day of our lives as we follow him. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you are a God that wants us to be happy. How great it is to know that the creator of the universe wants us to experience joy and happiness in every circumstance, in every segment of our lives, Lord. And God, I pray for those who are here right now who have never thought about this before, who've never gotten to the point where they've admitted how desperately they need you. I pray that even today, as they think about these things, as they reflect on Romans 3.23, as as we recognize the depth of sin in our own lives, I pray that they would come to the point where they would know and understand how deeply they need you and they would believe and trust in you for their salvation and not themselves, Lord God. 
God, I pray for those of us who are Christians that we would share this message, that we would, uh, that we would understand this sort of humility and carry it through our lives, Lord, that we would follow you and that we would be blessed by you, God, as we recognize how poor we are and how deeply we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.